Well, let's give it to you. Bad. Let's say so that... Let's say we've got it. Okay. Yes. So, now, now, what does so, that mean? What so, follows? So now, uh, the, the game starts to get interesting because you see here we see a link uh, between mind and matter through quantum physics. Uh, but what we're really after is not so much mind and matter, but mind and laws. Uh, because we'd like to understand why is the universe biofriendly? Why do the laws give rise to life and mind? It looks like a fix. Is there some way that the existence of mind and these laws can be linked? Is there a principle that links them together? And there is indeed, if we uh, get away from the idea uh, that the laws are some sort of God-given, pre-existing, uh, platonic uh, type of uh, entity that are just there for no reason. We think of the laws as more like a program being run on the great cosmic computer. They're uh, information processing. Uh, and that there is some lassitude in those laws, some uh, uh, sloppiness or uh, wiggle room, if you like, in the nature of those laws, because the universe uh, that we can observe, even in principle, is a finite system. It's not an infinitely precise computer. It's not a platonic computer existing in some realm of idealized mathematical forms. It is finite in age and finite in resources. And so that means that there is an inevitable um, lassitude, if you like, in the nature of those laws. And so because of this uh, wiggle room that the laws of physics have, uh, this enables the mind or observations to gain purchase, some sort of causal purchase over the laws of physics. Uh, so let me just contrast this with the standard picture. The Big Bang, the beginning of the, of the universe in the standard picture came with a set of laws already nailed down, absolutely fixed, precise, couldn't be any different. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that uh, at the time of the Big Bang, the, the laws of physics weren't completely and utterly laid down, that there was still room for manoeuvre, and that the existence of observers later in the universe, in a sense, selects from that uh, mishmash of possibilities, oh, yeah, just but, those but, universes that give rise to life and observers. So but, there's a self-consistency. But that means that what happens 12, 13 billion years later has an impact on, on what happened right. earlier, right. which seems like, uh, to a simple-minded person, backwards causation. Backwards causation is pretty much what it is, except <laughs> you have to be careful with that word causation. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right, because what we're saying is, somehow, back in the Big Bang, the laws worked themselves out in such a way that billions of years later, there will be people like us having this conversation. So that looks uh, sort of ridiculous, doesn't it? Because, you know, how can what happens now right. affect what happened then? But actually, physics has all sorts of inbuilt mechanisms of backwards causation like that. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting that we are literally, uh, by making observations today, uh, changing the past. Uh, it's more subtle than that. In quantum physics, you can do experiments today that affect the nature of reality that was in the remote past. And these experiments have been done in the lab in a very limited way. Uh, it's not that by uh, observing something today we change the past. You observe an electron today, measure yeah, yeah. its position or something. That's not saying that you change where it was a million years ago. Uh, but what it is saying is that uh, what we can say about the reality of a million years ago depends on the observations that we do today. You can't send information back in time. You can't tinker with the past, but you can still affect the past or be part of the past's reality by the decisions we make today. That's actually not controversial. That's established physics. Could you put it this way, that you're specifying of alternatives that existed, you're actualizing or specifying a set of them? Right. So Stephen Hawking has recently suggested that the way we should look at uh, quantum reality is to say, well, we make an observation of the universe here and now, and then we uh, follow back in time all the alternative quantum paths that could lead to that. And of course, we can only have quantum paths that are consistent with the existence of life and observers in the first place. What I'm doing is to extend those ideas from just states of matter to the laws themselves. I'm saying that uh, in, in uh, quantum reality, with this sort of backwards reaching effect that you get, it's not quite backwards causation, but it's a sort of backward congealing of things, uh, that this includes uh, the laws that will give rise to the observers in the first place. So that the universe fine tunes itself, it engineers its own self-awareness through the existence of observers that come later on in the scene. Aren't you doing something that scientists in general think is very ugly, and that is this bad word called teleology, which implies that, that the end result 
is what caused something in the beginning. Don't scientists find that anathema? Biologists find teleology anathema because uh, before Darwin, you see, there was this notion that uh, God had made the species for a purpose and that even if you believed there was evolution, it was sort of directed towards something or had a goal or something like that. Uh, Darwinism says evolution is blind. Uh, nature can't look ahead. Uh, it just uh, has the effect of randomly tinkering with things and the best gets selected. And so teleology is seriously out of favor with uh, biologists. Uh, but physicists, in a way, are more comfortable with it because you know, causality at the uh, fundamental level, if we're just talking about this atom affects that atom, uh, putting that backwards, that atom affects this atom. There's a symmetry there, a symmetry in time, which is absolutely fundamental in the laws of physics, that underlying time symmetry. Uh, now, in practice, when we see cause and effect at work in daily life, it seems to have a definite directionality to it. Uh, and anything that you play a movie backwards, people laugh because it looks so preposterous. Um, but at a deeper level in physics, we recognize that it can go in two ways. And so physicists, I think, are a bit more comfortable with the notion uh, that later events can affect earlier events, just as earlier events can affect later events. It's just masked in daily life by thermodynamics and all sorts of technical things. But what you're doing is taking that principle that works on an atomic and subatomic scale and hypothesizing, speculating, that it could be applied to the whole universe. The whole universe and the laws that underpin it. And that's the essential point. It's not just the state of the universe mm. that uh, we've got this sort of teleological observer dependent effect, but selecting the laws as well uh, in a manner that uh, permits these observers to come into existence in the, in the first place. So it's a sort of self-explaining, self-selecting, self-organizing system. Well, nobody will accuse you of not being bold. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit that uh, there are times when I look at this and I think, well, it does seem pretty ridiculous. But then all of the explanations, the ultimate explanations of existence, existence seem ridiculous.